Hello, my name is Dan Sullivan, and I have the honor to serve as the President and CEO for the Grand River Dam Authority. The GRDA is driven by our organizational blueprint, the five E's of excellence. We developed the five E's after gaining input from customers, employees, and stakeholders from Oklahoma with an interest in GRDA. These five guiding principles serve as our roadmap for how we spend our time and resources. One of our five E's of excellence is environmental stewardship. We prioritize the responsibility of being a good steward of the natural resources under our control while also working to improve the quality of life for everyone who utilizes those resources. We are immensely proud to share this wonderful video appropriately titled, Our Borrowed Water. This film is a testament to the beautiful natural resources we have in Oklahoma and celebrates the people committed to protecting and promoting those waters. We hope you join us in the recognition of the critical nature of this life-sustaining resource and the importance of being mindful of how we can protect our waters. We hope you enjoy Our Borrowed Water. It was a normal, bright, sunny day in late June. The guy that we work with uh, came in to the lab and said, man, you've got to go check out Bernice State Park. He said, I just crossed the bridge and it looked like somebody has dumped fluorescent green paint into the lake. So we ran out, pulled some samples, brought them back to the lab, and then it became very apparent what we were dealing with at that time. GRDA is warning folks headed to Grand Lake about blue-green algae on one part of the lake. There are high levels of blue-green algae out here. In the summer of 2011, on Oklahoma's Grand Lake, the water once known for being a brilliant shade of blue turned into a peculiar lime green color. It was blue-green algae and it threatened the entire ecosystem's water quality and a way of life for the people who depended on it. The extent of that bloom was unlike anything they'd ever, ever seen before. We weren't necessarily prepared uh, to deal with the toxicity of the samples. We really started to, to realize that these things are pretty dynamic when they take off. That's what was a real eye-opener to us is how rapidly conditions can change in the lake. People have grown up here uh, since this lake was built, you know, in 1940. It's really been part of their family tradition. But in 2011, everything changed. There's 78,000 miles of streams in the state of Oklahoma. And they're all as important to someone as this one is to me. Nestled in the rolling eastern hills of Oklahoma and the land of the Cherokees, Ed Fight has dedicated his entire career to the protection of clean water. I uh, live at a place on the Illinois River called Swananoa. S-W-A-N-N-A-N-O-A -N 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 Ranch. It's been in my family four generations. My great-grandfather, uh, Francis Barto Fight Sr., purchased this land. The Illinois River has been synonymous with my life uh, uh, as far back as I can recall. So my father was a surgeon and my grandfather was a surgeon and there was an expectation I'd be a surgeon. But uh, I got hooked on the river. I'll never forget the first smallmouth bass that I caught in the Illinois River or my first float trip. I always got shipped off to camp in the summer months to a place in Branson, Missouri called Canacut Camp. And we always did river trips. And so everywhere I went in my youth, I was exposed to water.
there was always an opportunity to come here and spend time. As I grew up, I started finding myself coming over here and floating, and so I ended up on river time. A river tells a story. It is chock full of memories, it's chock full of adventure. If you get away from a civilization and you get on a river and you focus on that river, you're connected. In my walk, I've spent all my time with this river, nurturing her and she's nurturing me. She is the uh, lifeblood of the human soul. There's never a bad day at the river. There's been times where I'm, you know, in the river and I'm just sitting there fishing. And I'll look down and because I've been so still as far as like my legs and I'm just casting, I'll look down and there's like a big trout just right next to me. It's like I've become part of the river. There's something really, really cool about that, you know, to be able to do that and to have that. And I think it just takes, you know, sometimes a little bit of quiet and just sitting there and just kind of taking it all in and you, you realize what's, all, what's there, you know. As a kid growing up in California, visiting the ocean or climbing the mountains of the Sierras was a way of life for Chris Castro. But while in high school, his family moved to Oklahoma. That's when he discovered the diverse landscape of his newly adopted land and soon began fly fishing and taking advantage of the natural resources that surrounded him. Fly fishing is just kind of is a little more in line with what I like to do. I just kind of enjoy slower things. You're just using feathers and these basic materials on a hook to catch fish. There's something just real peaceful about that process. Just fishing under this canopy of trees. I mean, it's just beautiful. The sound of the water, the shade, the filtered light coming through. You forget that there's anything around you except for like the sound of like the the stream just kind of singing, you know, and just kind of running over rocks. You really kind of quiet yourself. It's magical. It is a physical need for humans to get out into to wild spaces to float rivers, to, to hike a forest. Without these things, we've got a real deficit. From the heart of downtown Oklahoma City, Dave Lindo has been providing the paddling community with equipment, education, and experiences as owner of OKC Kayaks since 2006. People walk in and, and they go, what in the world? This is the Dust Bowl state, right? And I say, no, we have more shoreline than the East Coast and the Gulf Coast combined. We've got tons and tons of rivers and lakes and streams, lots and lots of water. We're not really in the business of selling boats. We're not in the business of selling all these great places to use the boats, but it's the fellowship business. The kayak is very therapeutic. We're all looking for some sort of reprieve from our, our daily grind. And more than, than doctors and therapists and drugs, what I see is that the kayak provides this outlet for them beyond belief. To me, kayaking and being on the water, it's my church. That's where I really can reflect and start to appreciate, like, I got all this around me. I can, you know, find my peace. I can uh, offer my thanks. Suddenly, you really get to focus in on the things that are important. Water is absolutely the gem that we have in Oklahoma outside our people. We can live without electricity. We can live without oil. We cannot live without water. 
one of my uh, manas for uh, everyone is stop picking up two pieces of trash every day. Every day of your life, everybody pick up two pieces of trash that's not yours from somewhere you go, you'd be surprised what we'd have. I'm the fourth river administrator for our state scenic river program. The previous three were uh, scientists, but I had an understanding of the river that was different than theirs. And at 1.30 promptly, we will start drawing tickets for these kayaks and our awards that we're going to give away, our prizes. My job is to make sure that water quality in all the streams that are under GRDA jurisdiction are protected to their best ability. In the uh, 1930s, 40s, 50s, we treated our rivers as dumps. Being near water, his communities dump their waste matter, their sewage, into the streams for easy disposal. Thus creating the serious problem of pollution. A problem which has grown increasingly serious as communities have increased in size. We had uh, waters that were being transferred from one river basin to another. We had many dams that were being built by the Army Corps of Engineers following the World War II era. Uh, we had uh, wastewater issues from these communities where raw sewage was going into our streams and causing impairment and, and uh, making some, pl some places people were actually getting sick. Each of us all across this great land has a stake in maintaining and improving environmental quality, clean air and clean water, the wise use of our land, these are part of the birthright of every American. To guarantee that birthright, we must act, and act decisively. The time has come for man to make his peace with nature. The 1960s is when everybody started changing, and we started looking at, we want to clean up our waters, and so the uh, Clean Water Act was passed. Uh, coupled with the Clean Water Act was that it was a directive to the states, you shall clean up. In 1970, the state of Oklahoma wrote its own Scenic Rivers Act. The act was implemented to benefit future generations at the state level by preserving the natural beauty of the land, protecting the waters, and enhancing quality of life with outdoor recreation. So I like to say I am a practical environmentalist, so I have my ideal, right, of what I would like us to be as a community, but I also know that it's, um, it's, tough getting that message across. As executive director for the Illinois River Watershed Partnership in Cave Springs, Arkansas, Nicole Hardiman works daily to improve the integrity of the Illinois River. Under her leadership, the IRWP works to ensure that the Illinois River and its tributaries will be a fully functioning ecosystem that meets state and federal water quality standards. This is a very unique ecosystem. We have some of the largest biodiversity in the state of Arkansas. I think the forests of Arkansas are probably, that that's what I'm used to seeing. The sounds of birds, tree species, that is my connection. Anytime I travel outside of my ecosystem, um, I miss the deciduous forests of Arkansas. Northwest Arkansas is the 22nd fastest growing metropolitan area in the United States. And we have 22 cities in the watershed and two counties. A watershed is the land area where rainfall collects and drains, ultimately to a single location. Two of the most important watersheds in Northeast Oklahoma that have recently seen excess nutrient loadings are the Grand Lake and Illinois River watersheds. These watersheds encompass hundreds of square miles, extending into Kansas, Missouri, Arkansas, and Oklahoma, making the job difficult to maintain desirable water quality. So what's happening as we urbanize is all of that storm water runs far and it runs fast. If you think about 
a concrete ditch versus even just a treed ditch, that water's moving much faster. If we don't plan for that quantity of water, then we are going to have more pollutant issues as it flows downstream. Since 2011, the waters of northeastern Oklahoma have had about three years where they've endured early nutrient loadings caused by runoff or extreme rainfall events. Excess nutrients are flushed into the system and are ultimately responsible for the blue-green algae outbreaks the region is now dealing with. The dams here that were built for infrastructure and electricity production 75 years ago are not natural. Uh, they're man-made lakes. Now we've had 75 years of, of loading into these lakes, contributing to these more recent wounds. We had a bellicose relationship with the state of Arkansas in the 80s. And the city of Fayetteville had historically, of all their treated wastewater that they generated in that community, it was pumped and discharged into the White River. Because that community was growing so rapidly, the wastewater plant wasn't able to put out a quality effluent that wouldn't impact the stream. Their engineers proposed to build a new wastewater upgrade to the existing plant to dis that would discharge half of that treated wastewater into the Illinois River, and we said, no, you can't do that. And people early on said, why can't you do that? So there was actually a Supreme Court decision back in the 90s stating that an upstream watershed was responsible for meeting a downstream watershed's water quality standard. So in an effort to comply, water treatment facilities in northwest Arkansas have been upgraded, along with increased regulations on agricultural lands, bringing the phosphorus concentration in water to just 0.03 milligrams per liter away from the new standard. That standard is valid, and where do we go from here? I own this land adjacent to the river right now. It's mine. I can dictate what goes on here. But that water belongs to the people of the state. When we say water quality, it's a lot more than just saying water quality. It's protecting the riparian area, that life belt along the river that nourishes the river and protects the river. Stream banks are basically naturally designed to handle, handle a certain quantity of water, but once you change that, it completely changes the dynamic that's going on in the natural stream bed. So in some areas of the watershed, we've seen up to 50 feet per year of land lost due to stream bank erosion alone. Farmers and ranchers throughout the watershed are now being asked to use conservation techniques to improve water quality. Things like conservation easements, soil and nutrient management practices, and healthy riparian buffers help to prevent the movement of sediment, nutrients, pesticides, and other potential pollutants from the land to our water. We have got to come to an understanding that in order to preserve this river and preserve its water quality, we have got to give this river its space. We can't develop every foot adjacent to the river and we can't go in and willy-nilly clear off all the hills of the vegetation. We've got to treat the system as a whole basin. So when you get excess phosphorus and nitrogen, excess nutrients, what you will have is an abundance of plant and algae growth. As you get this abundance of growth, oxygen will be depleted from the body of water, causing fish and bugs to die. This essentially becomes a dysfunctioning ecosystem. With ongoing climate change, we have to have smart growth in our cities. If you don't plan for those increased quantities in stormwater, you will get water quality impacts. Everything in this environment that we live in called Earth is dependent on two things, the aquatic community and terrestrial community. Every critter that lives here, the birds and so forth, rely on this water. And the aquatic community, they rely on things that fall out of those trees. 
All this vegetation filters the river. It also filters the upland activities. I mean, it's, it's all interconnected. And part of that connection is the people. Spending time outdoors, having fun and getting away from busy lives, simply being a part of nature. The recreation economy is enormous. Tourism is one of the biggest industries in the entire state. You know, water attracts people, it attracts recreation, it attracts commerce. It's, uh, you know, everything revolves around water. You don't see much of this at all if there's not water present. We want economic development here, but we also need to make a priority call to protect our natural resources. The definition of sustainability is you get an economic return, but it's also environmentally and socially friendly as well. We're trying to develop a new culture. Those people who are out here, whether they're using the river, visiting the river, working along the river, or living along the river, to be in harmony with the river. Nobody wants their family to be in like polluted waters and a place that, ha that has all this stuff dumped in it. Just trying to be mindful of the surroundings and not letting that stuff get into the water. If people can kind of um, put some faces behind like what they're doing, maybe see who it directly affects, I think most people would be like, oh man, that's kind of messed up, you know, or maybe we should do something different. A lot of times I leave a place and my pockets are full of monofilament and rusty old lures and stuff like that. I just pick them up and just kind of get them out of here. I mean, and sometimes with that, it feels like a losing battle. This is important. Like, this is, uh, I mean, we want people in the future to be able to come here and fish and enjoy the natural beauty without a bunch of plastic bottles and stuff floating around. Having clean rivers is certainly, it's something that we probably underappreciate. We underappreciate the value that it provides to, to us in, in terms of our everyday life or just to have access to, to good quality drinking water. It's up to us as citizens and advocates to make sure those places are always available, that uh, we've always got a clean stream to float a kayak down, or we've always got green spaces to, to get outdoors. Because without them, our quality of life is not as good, our economy is not as good. These are things that, it, it sells, it really does. Nature sells. Without the lake and without this dam created in 1940, uh, Northeast Oklahoma would look completely different. That's what we're trying to preserve is that heritage. Me and some of my friends have kids. We can kind of get together and fish and show them how to fish. It's also about the camaraderie and like talking and like now that you know we're adults like cooking and drinking beer and just hanging out. I mean, this is definitely my idea of relaxing. I mean, I see these trips really picking up more, just some father and son stuff. If I can teach my kid how to do that and then he continues it, it's, it's a really cool, it's a really cool like chain you're creating. It's just fun hanging out with my son like I would with like a buddy where you like stay out too late and then go grab fast food and go home super tired, you know? All of us are connected to water. We just don't know it. There are way too many people in the world um, who sometimes lose sight of the fact that we're just borrowing from our grandparents and our parents and we're passing it on to our children and grandchildren.
Thank you.